welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. One of the iconic achievements of American space exploration is, of course, the X-15. Michelle Evans' research for her book, The X-15 Rocket Plane, Flying the First Wings into Space, led her to interview nearly 70 people connected to the program, including Adam's wife, children, brother, and friends. Her unique perspective has been able to honor Major Michael J. Adams and to bring him to life as one of the X-15 astronauts in her fascinating presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you researcher and historian, Michelle Evans. Thank you again for having me here. It's really, really wonderful to be part of this. I uh, uh, really love coming to the Western Museum of Flight, and especially at this historic time. We're actually coming up uh, on the 24th of October will be the 50th anniversary of the final X-15 flight. Just amazing it's been that long. As Cindy said, I am Michelle Evans. I'm here to tell you the story of Major Michael J. Adams of the United States Air Force. He was an exceptional research pilot and an astronaut on the X-15 rocket plane, the fastest and highest X-plane that ever took to the skies. Adams was the first American astronaut who lost his life in the line of duty during a space flight. And yet little is known of him today. He was a family man with a beautiful wife and three children. And I hope that after today, you will remember Mike Adams for his part in America's early efforts in space exploration. Frida Adams made a point of attending each flight of the X-15, which her husband Mike flew for the Air Force. She recalled the first one saying, it was really scary, but exciting. It was sort of like Flash Gordon. Frida watched what preparation she could. They'd bring us out in a trailer and get us up pretty close. You'd watch him walk across and get into the X-15. She waved at him in hopes that he might see her, but knew that once he was in his pressure suit, his visibility was very limited. I was always standing there, wide-eyed, she said. I can still see him walking out slowly because in that suit, he, he had to sort of walk like a robot, you know? Now, once her husband entered the X-15, preparations continued. Eventually, the B-52 spooled up its engines, taxied away, then sped down the runway and off into the desert sky. While the lumbering bomber headed for the point on the map where her husband was dropped away to start his mission on the X-15, Frida then was taken back to the NASA control room where she watched the bulk of the mission unfold. Once the flight was over and the ground crew had helped Mike from the cockpit, she hitched a ride back out on the lake bed to greet him. It seems to me I was out on the lake bed most of the time, nothing but big space and lots of activity going on. Now, Mike Adams became the 12th and final X-15 pilot to enter the program. He made seven research flights matching NASA pilot Neil Armstrong. Adams served the shortest amount of time at just over 13 months from his first flight to his last. He was born Michael James Adams in California's capital city of Sacramento on 5 May 1930 staying in his hometown from grade school at Donner Elementary all the way through two years at Sacramento City College before leaving to join the military. His younger brother George remembered, when we were growing up, we did all the simple things in the neighborhood. In the summertime, we played kick the can and mumble peg and went to the matinee movie on Saturdays. It was a modest upbringing, but we enjoyed it. Mike's first job came while attending Stanford Junior High School delivering newspapers on his bicycle for the Sacramento Bee. Mike also spent time playing with his best friend, Charles Gerdell, who eventually recommended Mike to Frank Sims of Sims Hardware for a second job during his first year in high school. And working at Sims gave Mike a lifelong taste for the outdoors, especially things like target shooting and hunting. Another area where Mike excelled was in high school theater, which earned him a special mention in the Sacramento High Yearbook. He won a leading part in the drama club senior play with the role of Judge Harry Wilkins in the romantic comedy Dear Ruth. Don't often consider test pilots as actors as well. 
And outside of dating and hunting, he also enjoyed many other hobbies, such as fixing up old cars. In 1949, Mike acquired a 37 Chevy. He rebuilt this with one of his pals, and his brother George said he worked on it for the better part of a year. It was prime. Talking about Mike, you could easily see that George always looked up to his older brother. He wasn't real talkative, but I think he was liked and respected by those who knew him. Growing up, we slept in the same bedroom and he'd tell me ghost stories, which was pretty heavy stuff. At about the same time, Mike completed his second year at Sacramento City College. The Korean conflict broke out. Mike was a prime candidate to be swept up into the Army draft, so he made an end run, promptly enlisting in the Air Force. And after completing basic, Mike applied for officer candidate school. Two years later, 25 October 1952, Adams graduated from pilot training at Webb Air Force Base in Texas. He was shipped off almost immediately to Korea in April of 1953, where he flew the F-86 Sabre fighter bombers for a total of 49 missions during the war, earning him an air medal in the process. Returning to stateside duty changed his personal life forever when he met Frida Beard, a self-professed Southern belle. He came back from Korea and went to England Air Force Base in Alexandria, Louisiana, Frida told me. That's where I was living. My brother set up parties to get us together. Mike finally succumbed to the pressure and called her for a date. Frida remembered that he asked her to a movie on a Wednesday and then said, well, if we don't like each other, well, at least we don't have to waste the weekend. <laughs> Frida said she laughed so hard she nearly fell on the floor and agreed to go to the movie. After two years, Frida believed that Mike was finally going to pop the question over the Christmas holidays, but at the time he was a bit clueless about all this and bought her a 20-gauge shotgun instead. <laughs> she wasn't that enamored with the hunting idea, but she was great at target shooting, and as Frida told me, he liked flying, hunting, and family pretty much in that order. Mike finally got her hint, proposing soon after the new year. We married in January 1955, and not long after, he had to leave on a six-month tour to Germany. When he returned, it was almost like a stranger had gotten off that airplane. He came back, and we had to learn to get to know each other all over again. Once Adams had returned from Germany, he then pursued his military career in earnest. First up was heading to the University of Oklahoma for his aerospace engineering degree. This was also where Mike and Frida first child, Mike Jr., was born. Next up for Adams was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for advanced studies in astronautics, and also where his second son, Brent, came on the scene. He returned to Air Force duties at this point, being assigned to Chanute Air Force Base in Illinois as an instructor. Their third child, Lise, joined the family there. George also spoke of a very special pet which Mike took home to the family on one of his trips. When he was out here on a Christmas vacation, he'd flown into McClellan outside Sacramento, and the family acquired their first dog. Mike had bought a Brittany Spaniel. He put it in a cardboard box and tucked it in behind his pilot seat and flew home. Mike's son Brent explained further, I remember my dad trying all the time to make him into a bird dog, but he wasn't having any of that. My mom named him Tripod because us three kids kept fighting over whose dog this really was. Mike was selected to attend the Experimental Test Pilot School at Edwards, where he was singled out for his flying experience and as the best scholar of Class 62C earning him the prestigious Hunts Trophy. He then moved on up to the Aerospace Research Pilot School, also known simply as ARPS, and he was a member of Class 4. Adams graduated with honors in December of 1963. Now, with two astronaut groups already chosen by this point, Mike and his ARPS classmates, Dave Scott, applied for the third group. For a while, it appeared they both might make the cut, they had flown out to Brooks Air Force Base near San Antonio, Texas, in order to undergo medical evaluations. Then Mike and Dave jetted off to Houston for interviews at the new manned spacecraft center there. 
and the process was going smoothly. But then they returned to Edwards Air Force Base in an F-104 Starfighter. Their jet engine lost most of its thrust as they neared landing. Adams told Scott if they hit, he would eject. Scott pulled the nose up to flare for landing, but the back end of the F-104 struck the ground. Adams did as he said he was, as he said he would, safely punching away from the accident. But Scott stayed with the crippled aircraft, and in a serendipitous turn of events, both of them did exactly the right thing. When the F-104 hit the ground, the engine was actually shoved right into the area where Mike had been just a few moments before. If he'd stayed in the aircraft, he would have been killed. Dave Scott decided not to eject and stayed with the aircraft, also the perfect thing to do because if he had ejected, his ejection seat had been harmed by the actual landing and he probably would have died if he'd tried to punch out. So they both did exactly what the right thing was. These test pilots are pretty amazing, right? Now ejection is a severe process and Mike ended up with some temporary back problems and it took him out of running for that astronaut class. Dave Scott, however, was fine, and he did get picked and went on to fly into orbit on Gemini 8 with the former X-15 pilot, Neil Armstrong, and then on to the moon as commander of Apollo 15. Now, how did Mike react to the news of losing that astronaut slot? Freer recalled he was very stoic, no comment. But even with no words spoken, she could tell how deeply the loss of the NASA astronaut slot affected him. It was at that moment that all of her reservations disappeared about Mike's goals of becoming an astronaut. I wanted to know, why was he not chosen? It was a disappointment for me, and I'm sure it was a bitter, bitter disappointment for him. Having missed at NASA, Mike applied for the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program, or simply MOLE. The spacecraft used a modified two-man Gemini, as you can see here, which would have been connected to an orbital module full of surveillance equipment. It was a military spy platform on orbit and could have become America's first space station if it had ever entered service. Mole had been an attempt to create a standalone military presence in space. Adams became one of eight Mole astronauts announced on 12 November of 1965. Right from the start, Mole came under fire for militarizing space. Unmanned spy satellites were one thing, but adding astronauts on orbit, that was a different matter. So political niceties aside, the Cold War was also raging in full force, and in that climate, the Air Force continued to garner just lukewarm support for the continuation of Mole. Political haggling, though, was left for those in Washington, D.C., at the Adams home, Frida immediately saw the difference in her husband and his astronaut selection. She said, everything was really exciting when he was chosen. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for Mike's elation to fade as he figured out that his ride into space with the Air Force was going to be a long time coming. Mike's brother George said he definitely wanted to do more flying than he was doing, but he had at least gotten on to mole and be selected as an astronaut. But Mike expected the fast pace of Apollo that was going on in parallel with this. Instead, the only fast-paced thing on this program were the delays. From the beginning, launch dates kept getting further away, not closer. Mike's boredom was palpable, and he felt he had to move on. George told me when the spot opened up on the X-15, he jumped at that. Barely eight months after joining the astronaut team on the manned orbiting laboratory, Adams departed for the X-15, officially joining the rocket plane team on 14 July of 1966. He was elated to get flying towards space in the X-15 as soon as possible, saying in an interview to his old newspaper, the Sacramento Bee, I'm not particularly anxious to set any records, but if there are any, that's just a cheerful fact that goes with the mission. The speeds and altitudes exceed anything I've seen before. His move away from the mole was definitely the right one as the program was shut down without a man flight ever happening. Once he shifted to the X-15, Mike perked up again. Frida explained, it was like living in a unique world because that was a special thing. They treated you differently. The excitement from his wife and brother was much more visible than from Mike himself. Mike wasn't subject to opening up too much about things, recalled his brother George. He summed up, 
His older brother is quietly competent. If you don't ask him a lot of questions, you're not going to find out a lot. Frida explained Mike's single-minded purpose. When he set his mind to something, he did not waver. He got it done. Adams went to work preparing for his first X-15 flight. On 6 October 1966, Mike Adams was ready to launch the first step on what he hoped would be his path into space. Heading toward Nevada, Adams and X-15 No. 1 were firmly attached to the mothership's right-wing pylon. The launch lake was just inside the California border at Hidden Hills Dry Lake. After the turn to get the flight on the correct heading back towards Edwards, Adams dropped away from B-52 No. 003. It took less than a second after launch for Adams to get the rocket engine out of idle and to push forward on the throttle. The joy of that flight, however, was tempered in less than 90 seconds as the LR-99 rocket engine quit more than 30 seconds early. With 90 seconds on the mission clock, rules dictated that Adams had to land short of Edwards at Cuddyback Dry Lake. The control room, also known as NASA-1, radioed back, Okay, Mike, you look in good shape. But Adams replied, Well, looks like I could make Edwards. The controller makes sure that he understood the rules. Let's make it cutty back, Mike. But even with the emergency landing, Mike's demeanor was unfazed as he said, this thing is fun to fly, even if I did have to go into cutty back. Adams made a perfect touchdown on the center line of that dry lake, about a half mile into the three mile long lake bed runway. Fellow X-15 pilot Bill Dana said, that Mike's performance during the emergency was exemplary, especially for a first flight. He did an excellent job with that. You could tell by the way he was talking that he wasn't uptight about having to go into a strange field on that first flight. The second flight for Adams on 29 November was for further familiarization with the dynamics and handling characteristics of the X-15. He expanded his speed envelope to approximately Mach 4.5 Yes, yeah, like, oh, we're just barely incrementing up Mach 4.5. That's, yeah, pretty good. He increased the engine thrust from 50 to 75%, and that's the speeds that he got. And the increased power of the LR-99 rocket engine was evident in that this higher velocity was achieved, even though the burn time was reduced by 30 seconds. Winter weather and wet lake beds put off further flights for anyone on the X-15 for nearly four months. Drier weather permitted flights to resume on 22 March, where he was finally able to open up the throttle to the full 100%, recording his highest speed flight on the X-15 of Mach 5.59, 3,822 miles an hour. Launch this time was from Mud Dry Lake area, which was nearly twice as far as from Edwards as his first two missions. Now the next flight for Adams expanded his altitude experience up to 167,200 feet. By 15 June and after three successive aborted attempts, Adams was ready to launch on a much bigger leap in altitude, topping out at 229,300 feet. With that extra altitude also came extra time at zero gravity as the aircraft drifted through its ballistic arc at nearly Mach 5. Adams got somewhat annoyed by one aspect of having no gravity to hold things in place. He said, my checklist would keep flopping up and over and it was weaving around in front of me. I knocked it down, but it would immediately stand right back up and so I finally just quit fighting that. Mike allowed the pages to do as they wanted until gravity returned as he began his re-entry. After a successful re-entry from 43 miles high, Mike set up on final approach to the Rogers Lake bed. After landing, he said, compared to what I can do in the simulator and what I was doing in flight, I wasn't doing quite as well. Maybe we should fly more often. <laughs> Mike still craved a more aggressive flying schedule. After all, this was why he left Mole. Well, it took more than two months for Adams to get back in the X-15 cockpit and ready for flight number 362. Even though it had taken too long by Mike's reckoning, he was certainly ready to go. It was the first time since entering the program that he accomplished two back-to-back -back flights without any aborts in between, so he really liked that. On 25 August, Mike got ahead on his checklist and was obviously anxious to get underway. Mike went 
for the launch, saying, I hit the switch, I threw the throttle on as fast as I could, and I got a vibration malfunction shutdown. The X-15 continued its unpowered drop toward the ground as Mike ran through the restart checklist. 16 very long seconds later and more than 4,000 feet lower in altitude, that familiar hard acceleration of the LR-99 rocket finally kicked in. Adams compensated for most of the altitude loss at launch, leaving, leveling out just 600 feet below the planned 85,000 foot target. 85,000 feet, that's one of the low level flights. Coming down quickly, he prepared to land, later telling his debriefers, I don't know where I touch down, it just goes and goes and goes. This thing really floats, you can hold it off a long time. The X-15 is a good airplane. As the dust on the lake bed began to settle and the friction of the skids brought the aircraft to a full stop, the clock read 1.35 p.m. on the afternoon of 25 August 1967. After six flights, Mike Adams felt he was just getting the feel of this rocket plane. He looked forward to new and more meaningful missions, and he still had his sights set on space. He had no way of knowing he had just completed his final successful mission in the X-15. Moving to Edwards from Louisiana had originally been a shock to Frida. She'd been raised among the lush green and muggy air of the bayous. There was life everywhere. The high dry desert of California seemed like being dropped onto Mars. I got there and I thought this is the end of the world. But then I finally learned to love it. She found the climate and stark beauty of the area had a lot to offer. The three children, all born in different states as their father moved from assignment to assignment, seemed to thrive with the adventure of it all. For the senior Adams, it was a new place to explore as he found not only the desert, but the nearby mountains and rivers. Frida said, it was just a real fun time. We had good friends who would love to ride through the countryside. We saw more strange areas that no one else could ever see or find. We'd go up into Tehachapi and see these strange looking quail or up toward Kern County where there's this beautiful stream. Wherever Mike was, he was outdoors. Adams also loved his music. Frida remembers he played the guitar, played the piano and the accordion. He was talented. The kids used to play in bands, and we used to say they got it from their dad. They don't get far away from their dad and his achievements or his life. Mike rarely spoke of his flights or his work on the X-15. For the most part, he was regarded as a very serious man. Mike's brother George said he had a good sense of humor. He just didn't expose it unless you brought it out in him. This was exemplified in another photo from his days at Edwards. <laughs> at the time when wet lake beds forestalled X-15 flights, Mike expressed his displeasure at not being able to fly by having an image snap standing on the rain-soaked dirt umbrella over his head. But an even better indicator of his dry sense of humor was shared by fellow X-15 pilot Pete Knight who talked of Mike having to leave Edwards for a few days, so he asked Pete to drop by his place and see if he could water his plants for him. So Pete says, well, I went over to the house, I got the water bucket out, and I walked around. Every plant in the house was plastic. <laughs> in October 1967, Adam stopped in to see his family in Sacramento and decided to take a quick outing with his childhood buddy, Charles who told me, we took my dad's boat out. We were sitting out there waiting for the fish to bite. And Mike said, you know, I'm flying faster than those bullets coming out of a gun. It was just fascinating to hear Mike say that. That was the last I saw, Mike. Pete Knight took the X-15 to the highest speed on 3 October 1967, achieving Mach 6.70, 4,520 miles per hour. Coast to coast in about a half hour, right? Not bad. This is a speed record that still stands today more than 50 years later and is considered by many to be the zenith of the X-15 program. Four years earlier, NASA pilot Joe Walker had taken the X-15 to a height of 354,200 feet, 
67.1 miles, about 10 times higher than you fly in a commercial airliner. North American aviation pilot Scott Crossfield on 8 June 1959 was the first flight and the X-15 had been flown by a total of 12 NASA, Air Force, and Navy pilots on 190 research missions by this point. It was a successful and mature program, one that everybody thought was well understood, and dare it be said, routine. Aircraft number three went into final preparations, culminating with closeout of all systems on 13 November. The weather was not favorable, causing a one-day delay before finally being mated to B-52 number 008. X-15, tail number 66672, was finally ready for launch on flight 3-65 on the morning of Wednesday, 15 November. That means aircraft number 3 and the 65th time it would be launched. Colonel Joseph P. Cotton spooled up the B-52's eight jet engines and began his taxi onto the Edwards runway. In the right seat was squadron leader John Miller on temporary assignment from the Royal Air Force. This was Cotton's 12th time piloting the X-15 mothership and Miller's second as the co-pilot. Jack Russell was in his position as the launch panel operator, seated near a bubble window about the midpoint on the right side of the B-52's fuselage. Mike Adams was sealed into the X-15 cockpit mounted under the right wing. At 9.13 a.m., the B-52 and its X-15 cargo lifted off into the air and headed outbound. Adams was just along for the ride at this point, telling Chase One, I'm just a tourist. The B-52 and two Chase aircraft, piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Fred Cuthill and Hugh Jackson from NASA, proceeded northwest toward the Delamar Dry Lake launch zone. Cotton noted they reached their cruising altitude at 45,500 feet faster that day due to outside air temperature of a balmy 45 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. As launch time approached, Jackson moved Chase 2 into launch position about 100 feet to the left and behind the X-15. While Cuthill and Chase 1 moved directly off the B-52's right wing to obtain photo coverage and the drop and climb out. The launch master switch inside the B-52 was activated, allowing Adams to now control his own drop. Pete Knight called from NASA 1. Looks good here, Mike. Adams responded, Roger, 2, 1, launch. At 10.30 and 7 seconds, he commanded his launch release. Falling away from the pylon, he immediately moved the LR-99 throttle to 100% thrust. NASA 1 confirmed, Roger, we've got a good light here, Mike. The X-15 quickly outpaced Cuthill and Jackson in the chase planes. Adams angled upward through the stratosphere, heading to the top of his ballistic arc in the mesosphere. This configuration of X-15 number three had two six-foot-long pods mounted on the tip of each wingtip, as seen here. On the left were two experiments which opened up at high altitude. One was a micrometeorite collection box, while the other was a solar spectrum measurement device. The right tip pod held an extendable probe known as a bow shock standoff measurement experiment. This probe had not been properly verified at, in an altitude chamber prior to the flight, and in the vacuum, the electrical system started to arc, causing noise in the wiring of the X-15. This affected operation of several critical systems, including the aircraft's computer, which started to continually dump and reset a total of 61 times before the end of the mission. Adams kept trying to fix the problem, but it kept resetting, causing a major distraction as the flight progressed. Telemetry received on the ground showed Adams was on his flight profile, although they could tell his trajectory was slightly higher than planned. On the ground, they had no idea that the distraction of the computer was causing a second unknown problem. An instrument was set to measure different things based on a switch position. Mike had switched it from reading yaw to roll, then apparently forgot because of this continual computer glitch. So he kept reading it as yaw. 
At peak altitude, he hit 266,000 feet, and seconds later, he had inadvertently started to yaw the X-15 out of heading, quickly reaching 18 degrees to the right of his flight path. Nothing in the control room showed anyone this deviation, so no one knew to tell Mike of this mix-up. Adams continued to try to center the needle, magnifying this out-of-attitude yaw movement to the side. As he started to head back down toward the atmosphere, the yaw rate sped up. In 18 seconds, he was at 28 degrees. After 36 seconds, he passed 90 degrees. And just 47 seconds after it started, he had rotated a full 180 degrees. In other words, his X-15 was now pointed tail first into the flight path. Air started to bite into the wings and tail surfaces. Because of the reverse orientation, it quickly put the X-15 into a hypersonic spin, which lasted for 43 seconds. Such a condition had never even been envisioned. No other aircraft in history has ever gone into a hypersonic spin before or since. Mike tried to correct the spin using the reaction control jets. He called over the radio to Pete Knight. I'm in a spin, Pete. Knight didn't seem to understand, and Mike repeated the call two more times before going silent. NASA One continued to call on the radio, never envisioning the disaster unfolding high in the desert sky. Mike probably blacked out from the G-forces that were spinning him around at a very high Mach number. When the X-15 came out of the spin at 120,000 feet, it was once again finally facing back into the direction of flight. But a severe up and down porpoising motion at Mach 4.7 began, inflicting 15 Gs on the airframe. This quickly exceeded the aircraft's structural limits. At approximately 80,000 feet, the X-15 started to break apart from the aerodynamic loads, with the entire structure failing by the time it descended to 62,000 feet. At 10.35 and 20 seconds, just five minutes and 13 seconds after dropping away from the mothership's wing pylon, X-15 number three impacted the desert floor in a hilly area between Johannesburg and Ridgecrest. Mike was killed instantly. As is obvious from the flight radio transcripts, those in the control room and the aircraft aloft supporting the mission had no idea of the severity of the events which were unfolding even though Adams radioed three times in just 17 seconds that he was in a spin, it appears it never fully registered with anyone on the ground. Even at this point, most everyone expected that Mike had somehow either made an emergency landing or hopefully had ejected. It took 10 minutes for someone to see signs of the crash. A helicopter was dispatched where they found the forward fuselage and confirmed the worst. At 11.01 a.m., the flight surgeon made the radio call, dispelling any doubt of a miracle. This day started no different for Frida Adams from all the other X-15 flights when her husband was the pilot. She was at the NASA Flight Research Center watching the proceedings, and also joining her was Mike's mother, Georgia. She was in town to spend the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday with Mike and Frida and her three grandchildren. This was the first time that Georgia had an opportunity to see her son doing the job which had made him famous back in Sacramento. Frida sat quietly with Georgia in the NASA control room, not wanting to get in anyone's way as the flight proceeded. But soon after she heard the fateful call from Mike, I'm in a spin, Pete, she knew something was drastically wrong. Almost immediately, even as events continued to unfold, someone had the presence of mind to realize Frida and Georgia should no longer be in that room. She told me we were standing, listening, and of course everything was going awry. They quickly got us out of there. I can remember I wanted to help Georgia. I wanted to be sure she was protected from whatever. So I was trying to be the mother hen to her when I was probably falling apart myself. Several of the people I spoke with expressed grave misgivings about the X-15 program following this tragedy. This stemmed from how they felt the program had somehow lost sight of its objectives. Harry Shapiro, who's in our room today with us, 
an engineer on the external tank systems at North American, said North American was very concerned there was a lackadaisical manner about the way the people were handling this aircraft. I think the company felt we were going to lose more if we kept having this manner. We really had to treat each flight as a critical item. X-15 pilot Robert White shared the same sentiment, telling me, I often felt that sometimes we went too far with these things. When I was participating in the program, your eye was always on the ball. It was very intense. Now you're starting to take this as a routine thing. Boy, this is not routine stuff. Then there was this dual instrument presentation. You'd flip a switch, it would show you something happening, and you'd flip it another way, and that same needle would show you something else. I thought, give me a break. That NASA is not the NASA that I operated with. In the context of the opinions of both Shapiro and White, it can be argued that the historical roots of the later Challenger and Columbia space shuttle disasters can be seen as early as 1967 with the Adams accident. In the investigations for all three, people can go back and say they saw the problems beforehand, yet no one was able or willing to step forward and get the attention of those who could have broken the chain of events before they spiraled out of control. The traversing probe experiment in the X-15's wingtip pod produced electrical problems because it had never been tested in vacuum and was the ultimate root cause of what happened that fateful day. Yet instead of questioning this lack of testing, someone assumed that since it had flown before, then that was good enough. As was stated in both space shuttle loss investigations, the deviation from normal was now being accepted as being the new normal. Any variance from expected parameters should never be considered normal. Definitely not routine. Good people died in all three because of complacency and not wanting to be the one to stand up and say something was wrong. Directly as a result of Adam's accident and the subsequent investigation and report, two specific changes were made in the way that the X-15 program was run. First was that future flights would ensure that the pilot had all of his pitch, roll, yaw, heading, and angle of attack information, and that a telemetry channel to NASA-1 would provide these same data to the controllers on the ground in real time. Even though the X-15 continued to fly for nearly a year, the heart of the program had been shattered along with Mike Adams and X-15 number three. Funding existed through the end of 1968, but no one wanted to push their luck anymore before it was finished. X-15 crew chief Charlie Baker said, We were a nice little team. We were a family. You knew all the pilots. It was a glorious thing. Until that day, when you lose one of your family, you lose a part of yourself. Out of the three rocket planes, only the number one ship was left to finish out the program at this point. Once the investigation was completed, the broken remains of X-15 number three were sanctioned to be buried in an unmarked grave in the desert. For Mike, his legacy is that flight test community learned a powerful lesson in safety. Ten years before his last mission, pilots seemed to be throwaway items out at the base. Almost every week, someone was being replaced after one crash or another. A decade later, losing a pilot to an in-flight accident was a rarity. Unfortunately, these lessons were apparently not transferred to the space shuttle program, later costing two very expensive vehicles and two irreplaceable crews. When a tragedy strikes, the exact moment becomes a fixed point in time, one which never diminishes in your memory. Charles Gurdell, Mike's best friend, was crossing the 8th Street Bridge in Sacramento when he heard the news on the radio. Mike's brother George was in an attorney's office. I got a phone call there from a military spokesman, and he informed me of the fatal accident. It was a severe shock, suddenly having to cope with something that heretofore was not possible. It's like anything else. You don't think it's going to happen to him or to you. A memorial service was held at the Edwards Base Chapel on Saturday, 18 November, at 3 p.m. Chaplain Roy gave the eulogy, intoning, the flight testing profession has lost a dedicated pilot, and the United States Air Force has sustained a great loss. 
He gave his life doing the thing he most wanted to do. This was a sentiment echoed by Charles when he said, Mike loved that plane. We hated to see him go, but he died doing something he loved. I couldn't imagine Mike being in an old folks home someday. The memorial concluded and the people filed outside for a last tribute as a group of Edwards Flight Test Center pilots flew a formation of jet fighters over the chapel, one of the planes pulling up sharply as they passed overhead in tribute to the missing man. Within just a few weeks, Frieda and her children had to vacate their home at Edwards. She chose to move the family back to Louisiana rather than Sacramento. Her roots were in the South. You go right back to your own people, she told me firmly. Mike also went with her to be interred close by. Frida thought it was the right thing to do, and the family in Sacramento didn't argue. She always remained close to Mike's family and often crossed the country to visit. Frida settled in Monroe, Louisiana, returned to college to finish her master's degree, where she also met her future second husband, George, a college professor who specialized in theater arts. I loved working in my flower garden. You didn't get to do that out at Edwards. Mike's X-15 flight had been scheduled for an altitude of 250,000 feet, but his peak altitude ended up being 266,000 feet. Those extra three miles made a lot of difference in one very specific respect. In the 1960s, the U.S. Air Force held the official position that any pilot who exceeded 50 miles in altitude was to be considered an astronaut. On 15 November 1967, Mike Adams accomplished his goal in the X-15 with less than a half a mile to spare. In the end, his dream of entering space had finally been realized. On Tuesday, 16 January 1968, Frida made the 80-mile trek west to Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana. There, with little ceremony, she received her husband's Silver Air Force astronaut wings. It was a status for her husband, which Frida told me she would have preferred to forego if Mike could have instead returned alive from his flight. You can't help but be bitter when you have to go through something like that. Just think what could have been. Looking back at her years with Mike, she had regrets, but also wonderful memories. We had a good life and all. When he would go out early, he'd fly over our house and wave those wings. I was out waiting to see him go by. A memorial created by Eagle Scout John Bedelsky now marks the spot in the desert where Mike Adams lost his life. One evening, not long before his final flight, Mike Adams decided to take his two boys, Mike Jr. and Brent, along with their nephew David, out to the NASA hangar at Edwards for a private tour of the area where their father and uncle worked. At the time of this nocturnal visit, the hangar was filled with a wide variety of experimental aircraft in all sorts of strange shapes and colors. Adams let the boys explore and even opened up the cockpit of some of the aircraft so they could sit in the cockpits and pretend they were flying at high Mach numbers themselves. Remembering his long-ago childhood, a giant grin appeared as Brent recalled that magical night with his father. I believe all three X-15s were in there that particular night. I'll never forget that. Dave said, I remember walking beneath the B-52 as we entered the area, and it was just amazing to have done that. I remember that so vividly. It really left an impression on me. I asked Brent which image is the first to come to mind when he speaks of his father. It would be with his flight suit on, out there standing on the lake bed. If there's a second image, it would be him fishing or something, maybe at Lake Tahoe. This image of Mike out in the forest or on a lake is the way so many of his family and friends remember him, although the public image was always of a very serious man standing stiff and unsmiling next to the X-15. But Mike was much more than that, as Bill Dana related. He was just a great big bear of a guy. Mike was really laid back compared to the average test pilot who was running at max gain all the time. He was just different from those other guys on the program. With all Mike had gone through, from losing the NASA astronaut selection due to the F-104 ejection injury, 
becoming frustrated with the lack of progress on the mole program to the point of leaving that program and finally being selected to fly as one of the elite test pilots on the X-15, maybe in the end he found his heart being drawn in a different direction. Perhaps inner peace for Mike Adams would not have been in outer space, but in the back country of America. Dana shared a thought to me that opened a tiny window into the soul of Mike Adams. He talked like he was ready to get out of the Air Force and go be a forest ranger. I don't think he actually would have done it, but that's what he claimed he wanted to go do, go be a forest ranger. Maybe Mike would have chosen this new path, and I bet he would have been exceptionally good at it if fate had not intervened so tragically that day. Thank you for being here for Mike Adams. I've been honored to share his life with you today. I hope that you will remember Mike the next time you look up into space on a clear night. Good day to you all. If you have any questions about Mike or the X-15 program, I will be glad to spend as much time as you'd like here and talk about him. Thank you all so much. She asked if uh, Georgia and Frida were actually at the location when he crashed. Of course, they were not out in the desert, but they were at NASA. Again, both of them had been out on the lake bed to watch him get into the X-15 and get ready for the flight, and then both were in the NASA control room when the accident was occurring. Yeah, she wants to know what the, what the most uh, uh, memorable anecdote was, uh, the X-15 or Mike Adams? Either one. Either one. Uh, I think my favorite about Mike is about the plastic plants that Pete said. I mean, that was, that was pretty great. Yeah, please go water my plastic plants. <laughs> and Pete fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the X-15 itself, there's so many that I could share. The biggest one that I definitely want to make sure everybody knows is that people really thought of the X-15 as their family. One of the things I got from all these guys was the fact that they they kept coming in to work when they shouldn't have been at work. Somebody would have a cold and they'd come in and spread it to everybody else because they all wanted to be there. They didn't want to stay home. Yeah, he wants to know where the other two X-15s are. There's three X-15s. We lost X-15 number three. The other two vehicles still survive. The number one aircraft is hanging in the milestones of flight gallery when you first walk into the National Air and Space Museum on the mall in Washington, D.C. It's actually not that accessible because it's hanging up there, but you can still get pretty close to it. Number two aircraft is at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, so that one you can actually get pretty much right up next to it, sitting on there. They've just opened up a new hangar. It used to be you had to take a bus over to see it, but now they've got the new hangar, so it's over where you can get into it when you just go to the regular museum, and it's well worth the trip. He wanted to know when the X-15 program started. It started back in the mid-1950s with the design. Uh, they were looking to do high Mach research around Mach 6 was what they were looking for at about 250,000 feet. And so there was a design competition held between North American Aviation, Republic, Bell, and Douglas, I believe were the four competitors. And it ended up that North American Aviation won. And uh, they went forward, the rollout of the X-15, the first X-15 came out on 15 October of 1958. That was just two weeks after NASA became NASA. So that was literally their very first program that they brought out to the public. And then it flew through 1968. The first flight occurred in 1959, and then the final flight in 1968, a total of 199 flights in the entire program. He wanted to know about uh, any research having to do with uh, Mike Adams having vertigo. I, I didn't really touch on it in, in the presentation, but that was unfortunately a contributing factor in the accident. What happened in this case was the fact that, remember that this stuff was all occurring during the very early days of the space program. And if you've seen movies or read the books like The Right Stuff or something, you know that they really subjected those early astronauts to just a battery of medical testing because they really didn't know what they needed a test for. So they just came up with stuff all over the place. And they didn't feel that they had a really good test for vertigo, to measure vertigo. And when Mike was brought on to the mole program, they had come up with a new test to gauge possible vertigo. And out of all the astronauts, 
Mike failed that test and he failed it very badly. He was much, much more susceptible than everybody else. But the test was considered experimental. So it did not go onto the record and it was not talked about. It never went against him at all. So later they found out it obviously was a good test, unfortunately, because that's what they believe ended up occurring because of the distractions of the computer dumping, the needle being wrong and everything else, he most likely ended up with vertigo that helped, I hate to put it help, but you know, led to that situation. And there were other indications, people like Milt Thompson, X-15 pilot for NASA, told me that Mike had come to him after his very first flight and told him he had had vertigo on that first flight. Now, many of the other X-15 astronauts had said, you know, they get a little bit of disorientation or something, because when you drop off the wing of a B-52 and you get slammed in the back by this giant rocket engine, you can get a little bit of vertigo, right? Or you can get a little bit of disorientation. But Mike was the only man that ever used the word vertigo to anybody. And so again, that goes back to this idea I was talking about that the, the signs were there and nobody wanted to step up and say, well, maybe we shouldn't be flying him at the high altitude. Maybe the lower altitude flights would have been better. Let's keep him in the, in the lower out. We'll do the speed flights and let somebody else do the, the altitude flights. So it is an unfortunate thing, and it was officially cited in the accident report as a contributing factor because they did go back and they pulled that medical record uh, from those vertigo tests to say, yeah, this is what was there. And no other astronaut had had those kind of test results. So an unfortunate truth. Uh, Doug wanted to know what, what started my interest in the X-15. Um, that's my dad's fault. Uh, when the X-15 started flying, I was, what, four years old when it started flying? And my dad, uh, he worked for a company called Sangamo Electric at the time. And what he did was he supplied these 16-track tape recorders that would record telemetry coming down from the test missions. And his area included China Lake, Edwards Air Force Base, places like that. And I was in kindergarten. I was going off to kindergarten one day and my dad said, you know, I'm going up to Edwards. Would you like me to come pick you up after kindergarten and you can come up there with me? So I go out there after, after class that day. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning and he went and picked me up out on the curb and drove me out to the high desert for the first time. And I got to go out to Edwards and I fell in love with that place. The airplanes, the, everything that was happening, it was just amazing. Uh, one of the things that happened, I talk about it, uh, the opening of my book, the introduction of the book, I actually have broken into three sections. And the first is I introduce everybody to the airplane itself. What is the X-15? The second is I introduce you to one of the pilots, in this case specifically Jack McKay, who was the fifth pilot on the program. And then the third section is telling exactly why I'm the one writing the book. So it goes into that story a bit of what happened. And one of the things that happened to me when I was up at Edwards, my dad had to go off and get all this work done, right? So what would he do? He'd pawn me off on some friend of his up there to go take me around to the hangars and wherever else so he could get his work done. And this one day, the guy took me around and he decided to take me out to what's called the Iron Bird. It was the simulator for the X-15 that was sitting in the hangar back there. And he said, oh, we're, we got somebody flying the X-15 simulator. Would you like to go see it? So he takes me back in the back, and you can hear the hydraulics pumping and everything. It was really cool. And we got there pretty close to the end of the flight, and everything shuts off, and the pilot gets out. And he could have just, you know, got up and walked away and gone back to his office. But he actually came over, and he introduced himself to me and shook my hand a little five, six. I was probably six at that time. His name was Neil Armstrong. And of course, at the time, Neil Armstrong, you know, who the, who the heck is he? For me, the person at the top of the pyramid was Joe Walker. He's like, oh, I want to meet Joe Walker. Who's this Neil Armstrong guy? But of course, you know, as fate intervened later, we certainly knew him a lot more. And Neil was one of nine out of the 12 astronauts that I was able to talk to. I spoke with all but Adams, McKay, and Walker, who had all passed away before I started my research. This book took 30 years years of my life from start to finish. So this is literally my life's work. And it's people like Dave Stoddard who opened up so many doors for me. You know, it was easy for me to go in there and find the
the guys at the top, the pilots, the managers and stuff, but it's people like Dave, you know, Harry Shapiro, these guys who open up the door for the guys in the trenches, the people who really made it happen. Because without Harry, without Dave, with all, all these guys here, without what you, what you guys did, none of this would have happened. Neil never would have flown, Joe would have never flown, Mike would have never flown. So you're the guys that I'm really excited about, and you guys made this whole book possible, and I cannot thank all of you enough for everything that you did for this program. So, yeah. Dave, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Harry, yay. Are you guys over there, yes. You should all be very proud of your work, absolutely, yes. Any other questions? I guess we're all done then. Thank you all so much. Good day to you all. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.